All right, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm Kiana Montest. I'm from Samtech, and in today's presentation, we're going to be looking at interconnect models, simplified channel wide modeling simulation, and towards the end, we're going to look at 112 gigabits PAM4 and Cadence Clarity 3D simulation tool. So in terms of modeling interconnect, there are two methodologies that we typically use. One is fully mated or end-to-end -end connector simulation, which consists of two breakout region and their mated interconnects solved simultaneously. On the other hand, we have our cascaded models, which consist of the same parameters. However, it is solved independently. So the reason why we're comparing both methodology is because cascaded models, even though that's been used by a lot of designers, can be inaccurate. It is convenient, but it is inaccurate, especially in high-speed applications such as your 112 gigabits PAM4. But I'm not saying that cascaded models shouldn't be used. It is still acceptable in lower application models. So in high-speed, it could be optimistic or you can get a poor performing results. You can see towards the end or towards the slides that I'm going to be talking about, you'll see missed or shifted resonances in our results. So for a fully mated uh, simulations, um, we can capture more EM effects, especially in higher frequency application. Um, the interaction between um, your PCB and connector becomes more important, right? And so this is achieved by porting our models to a well-defined um, TEM models. The agenda for today would be, again, comparing your cascaded model to your interconnect models. Um, and, and then later, we're going to look at the different resonances, or if there's any, in the different reference planes that we would place in our, in our channel. And again, we're going to look at 112 gigabits PAM4 channel simulation variation using Cadence Clarity simulation tool. What I have here is just a diagram of possible splice that we typically used in our simulation channel. So um, in a cascaded model, you can have S parameter for your multi-pin connector. You can also have an S parameter for a breakout region or your PCB region. So this is independently. However, with end-to-end -end models, like I said, all of this from breakout region on one end to the breakout region on the other end are solved simultaneously. Before comparing our cascaded models and end-to-end -end models, we want to look at what cascaded models again, right? Our cascaded models essentially is taking two or more S parameters and combining them together. This is based on your linear network theory, done according to this formula on your right. Typical assumption that we have in this theory is that they are isolated and independent components. This boundaries between S parameter could be strip line or microstrip coax and all that. There are advantages on using one over the other. So again, with end-to-end -end models, because we have that breakout region already getting simulated simultaneously with the connector, we're getting more accurate results. For the cascaded models, the advantages is, is that it's faster solving time, right? Especially for a multi-pin connector. If you have a larger model, it'll, it'll take time. You have a larger tetrahedral, it'll take longer to mesh, meaning you're ill time to get your results. And the second advantage is um, you can do an interchangeable PCB. So essentially, if, for example, you have a stack up or a breakout region that you want to replace because you change your mind with a stock up, you can easily replace that specific S parameter of your breakout region with another new another one. And of course, that goes hand in hand with you know more manageable simulation. So let's compare the results of a cascaded model to end-to-end -end, end -end models in terms of our crosstalk. So what I have here is the red curve being cascaded and the purple curve being the end-to-end. -end. And as we can observe, there is resonances that is present in our end-to-end -end model, but not in our cascaded model. So what is causing the issue? The way we're going to look into this is first, we're going to simplify our connector model, meaning we're going to remove unnecessary elements that complicate the results. We're going to have no mating, inter mating interface. We're going to have pin uniform pin geometry, meaning just like a, a rectangular geometrical structure. We have our uniform solder geometry. Um, and it's also important to note our other connector characteristic of this model. It is open pin field. 
a differential multi-pair, and a solder ball connections. So how do reference planes affect crosstalk resonances? Before uh, we look at the different scenarios here, it is important to note that the specific resonance that we're talking about are length-based resonances, right? So the way we co compute those resonances is determining what the speed of the electrical propagation to the dielectric and the length of the pin. Then that's how we find the halfway resonance at that specific decay value and length of the pin. So essentially, this resonance is based on the length of the pin uh, in between the ground planes, which is roughly about one ohms. And then you're, the length of the pin having 50 ohms, massive discontinuity between the ground planes, which causes resonances um, and which results to your reflections. So if we, for the first scenario here, we have splitting or having the resonance reference plane on the BGA balls, Obviously, we can't see that resonance since we don't have that ground plane included in the model. So if we go to the scenario two, which we have a reference plane in your layer one, we still said that there is no resonances. So essentially we said, okay, it might be a ground impedance discontinuity, but there's another factor that's contributing to the existence of the resonance, right? The pore at layer one causes a, a single return path from the BJA balls and into the antipad edges. And so that causes essentially the energy is escaping through the PJ instead of building up and resonating through the layer one PCB. For our third scenario, we have essentially the end-to-end -end models where we have layer one and then our port impedance or reference planes is located to layer two. Now we have the current at layer one propagating throughout um, our PCB. And so that's where we're seeing the ground impedance discontinuity. So if we're looking at, again, the results for our crosstalk, we can see that they're all in the same behavior. However, we still see some resonances that are only occurring in our end-to-end -end models. So again, that is based on like the length-based resonances. If we're looking at insertion loss and return loss, a full BJ ball has worse matching because of that single current coming from the BJ balls again and through the antipad edge on layer one. And essentially the half BJ balls matches moderately well up to 20 gigahertz. And then as, like I said, as a higher, as we go in higher frequency, the accuracy kind of diminishes between cascaded models. In conclusion, the cascaded connector models can misstate performance, right? We didn't, we saw a resonance, resonance in the end-to-end -end model, but we didn't see it in our cascaded models. So we could also see a non-real impedance spike and either better or worse channel performance. Connector can also cause energy to accumulate on PCB ground planes and allows us to energy to disperse. So it's important that we also include that the PCB interaction between the connector and your PCB. I, like I mentioned, the resonance that is in question here is um, length-based resonances, and the idea can be carried over on other types of um, resonances as well. The solution here really is that you have to consider where your TEM region is, and it should be well-defined. Ports can be absor absorb energy and prevent that reflection. Ports too close to a resonating structure. It might be you know, your antipads, your voids, a cluster of vias. So let's make sure that our port is far away as possible. Let's look at um, 112 gigabits PAM4 simulation in Cadence Clarity 3D Solver. Um, again, comparing end-to-end -end models versus cascaded models. So what I have here to your right is Samtech's Novaray encrypted models. If not everyone, if you guys didn't know, uh, Cadence and Samtech has been working on creating library for encrypted 3D components. And this is one of them. Just want to have a spill. We do also offer evaluation kit for most of our connectors. So if you guys want to measure it in your lab, then please feel free to contact kits and boards at samtech.com. So essentially we have this encrypted 3D component. We import it into the Clarity workspace with an existing test board. Basically we'd have, you have your breakout region, your test, your trace and into the SMA. And as we can see, they're not necessarily like on top of each other, right? 
as we go in higher frequency, we can see the differences between both end-to-end -end models and cascaded models. And even in, if you look at return loss, it's kind of optimistic. As cascaded models could also have misleading capacitive dips or impedance spikes. In summary, end-to-end -end models are really important when it comes to simulating your connectors. Because again, cascaded models is still suitable or acceptable in lower frequency applications such as 112 gigabits PAM4, you would want to consider end-to-end -end model simulations. We want to have our ports at a well-defined boundary. So either you know, trace or coax and keeping them away from a resonant structure. We are now offering 3D encrypted models with Clarity simulation tools. So you can also visit www.tech.com at 3D models for more information. Thank you.